Hi, I'm Alex Sudris, and thanks for joining us tonight on Bold Method Live. <laughs> Saw a lot of screen flashing there. I'm Alex Sudris, and thanks for joining us tonight on Bold Method Live EFR. Tonight, we're going to be talking about engine fires. And we're talking about this because it's still summer. In fact, in some parts of the U.S., we're entering the hottest part of summer, especially on the western uh, coast into August and September. And most engine fires happen because of the heat. The heat's not actually what causes them. It just screws up our starting. And then that ends up causing engine fires during start or engine fires on the ground. So that's why we're talking about this tonight. And it feels like it's been a little while. Uh, we were offline for Oshkosh. And then I had the stomach flu on our next or last scheduled appearance. You definitely did not want me in front of the camera. So everything's hopefully back to normal uh, and we'll be back to our every other week schedule. Okay, uh, Corey Comerick and uh, Sway Martin are both flying tonight. So Colin Cutler is both the technical director and he'll be handling chat at the same time. And the entire point of a live presentation is that we can take your questions throughout the show. So as we're going through this, if you have any questions, if, if I'm not going into enough detail or you want me to explain something, throw those out in chat and Colin will work those into our presentation. Don't save everything until the end. So tonight we're gonna to talk about engine fires. And we're gonna start with the most common type of an engine fire, which is an engine fire during start. That's gonna take up most of the time, but then we're gonna also talk about two additional kinds of engine fires. We're gonna talk about the classic engine fire in flight, which is fairly rare. And then for those of you who are flying turbocharged aircraft, we'll take a look at what happens when the exhaust manifold separates around the turbocharger and some of the problems that you can get there that can also quickly lead to an engine fire. Uh, but to really get things started with engine fires during start, you really have to take a look at what happens during the starting process. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at how we prime the engine and get the engine ready to start and how that itself can actually lead to an engine fire during start. And then we're gonna walk through two different engine fire during start procedures. You're gonna notice they're, mo they're very much the same, uh, but they're for two very different piston-driven aircraft. We're gonna look at a Cessna 172, and we're going to look at a Cirrus SR22 Turbo. And we'll see how those, those procedures are essentially the same because even though the airplanes are different, essentially the same thing is happening during start, and we want the same things to happen if we have an engine fire during start. Okay, so let's take a look at the iPad. We'll start by talking about priming. So, this right here is your basic cylinder. And what we've got, if you take a look, this tube here on your left, this is the intake manifold. So in this case, you could imagine air is gonna go into the engine, cool air, I'll draw that a little bit smaller. So let's do maybe like, yep, cool air going into the engine. And then on the right side, you've got your exhaust manifold. And so this is where the hot burned air essentially leaves your cylinders. So we're gonna take in cool air here, we combust it inside the cylinder, and then it's gonna exit up and out over the exhaust manifold. You'll notice we've got two ball numbers here, uh, number one and number two, these are your possible priming points. So what you'll find typically in fuel injectored aircraft, the fuel injector actually sits right about, generally right here, right in what you could call the intake uh, sleeve or the you know the intake port it's outside of the cylinder okay so the injector is generally not inside the cylinder but it's right outside of that intake valve and what that does is that sprays essentially a fuel mist right into this little intake port and so then as this valve opens that mist is sucked right into the cylinder so on a fuel injected airplane when we go to prime the aircraft, we don't have a dedicated primer. Really, we're just using the fuel injectors to do the priming for us. So if you've ever flown a fuel injected aircraft, typically you have an electric fuel pump, and that fuel pump typically has two different flow settings. One is normal or low, and then the other one's called high slash prime. And that high slash prime essentially adds some extra pressure behind the fuel flow. That's what creates that quick mist of fuel exiting that fuel injector. And if we go back to the iPad, you can see that that will sit right here in the um, intake valve sleeve. 
Okay, the other place that you could possibly prime would be in the intake manifold itself. So let's say if you don't have a, a, a fuel injected engine, you're running a carbureted engine. Well, most of you know you have a primer knob or a primer button that you're going to push. And that shoots fuel through separate primer lines. We'll talk about that in a second. Those primer lines are essentially either going to go directly into that intake sleeve or oftentimes are going to go back a little bit further into the intake manifold. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So I said in fuel injection, what you'll notice is that the fuel actually is sprayed right before the intake valve. The other advantage, we've only shown one side of an engine here, a four cylinder engine, but on a fuel injected engine, you're going to prime all of the cylinders. And that's because every cylinder is equipped with a fuel injector. So we're going to prime every cylinder on the engine. When we look at a carbureted engine, the priming actually starts to vary by design and how the, pr the primer itself is set up. Typically that line is going to spray in front of an intake, though not always, it could, it could spray inside the manifold. And you could have anywhere from one cylinder primed to several. Okay, looks like we've got our first question. So actually our first question comes from John and he uh, was asking exactly what you were just talking about. He says, why does a carbureted engine not prime every cylinder? And is that the case for all engines or is it subjective? How does that work? That's a great question, John. And actually we talked to John, our mechanic this morning uh, out at Arapaho Aero uh, to get an idea of that because I've flown quite a few different carbureted engines. I've had one cylinder primed, I've had two or three cylinder primed, but I've never had every cylinder primed. And talking to John, you know, he wasn't quite sure why, but it's the same thing. Typically, you have a priming line um, or a priming unit on top of that engine, and then there's little lines that go out from that unit, and those lines go into that kind of intake sleeve right before the intake valve. And again, it could be one, it could be two, it could be three. It's generally not all. I don't know why. Um, it could be because they're trying to re reduce the risk of overpriming. It could be to reduce weight. Um, but I do know that in carbureted engines, typically it's going to be one, two, several cylinders, but not all of them primed. The fewer cylinders that have primer lines, oftentimes the harder the engine is to start when it's cold, because essentially you're only getting one cylinder to prime. And considering on where that propeller is stopped, that cylinder may be the last to open. So it could take a little bit before that cylinder actually sucks that primer charge into, uh, it goes through the intake valve and into the cylinder. And that's why if we go back and look at this, sometimes you'll see that the prime actually comes in right here. So before either of the cylinders intakes. The advantage here is that if this cylinder happens to open first, the primer charge can flow back and get sucked into that cylinder. If this cylinder opens first, then the primer charge will flow back and get sucked into this cylinder. So there's kind of some thought to it. Um, if you can't prime several cylinders, the more cylinders you prime, the better the, you know, the faster that intake charge will typically, typically get picked up. If you prime a little further ahead in the intake manifold, it will get sucked down to that first opening cylinder. But there are some problems here. And let's take a look at what happens if we start to over prime. Okay, so the concept with priming, and actually we'll go back to me for a second, because I always like to see myself on the screen. Um, when we talk about priming, we have to keep in mind that um, this fuel isn't really atomized. It's more like a mist. So if you think about something like maybe you've used an inhaler or you've seen someone with an inhaler uh, and you kind of get that really fine vapor, um, but if you put your hand in it, you don't really get any water on you. It's essentially just atomized. That's not really what's happening when it's coming out of the primer lines or the fuel injectors. Instead, it's more of a mist. It's a fine mist, but if you were to spray that mist on your hand, you would start to turn your hand wet. I mean, you'd see water on your hand. And the same thing will eventually start to happen inside your intake manifold. Okay, looks like we've got another question. So Dominic has a good question about all of this. He says, why do we need to even prime an aircraft engine opposed to other types of engines that don't need priming? What's, what's the point of priming? 
That's a great question. Well, part of it is when you look at an automotive engine uh, or modern, modern four-stroke engines, you have things like variable timing um, and automatic mixture control. Essentially, the engine is doing all of the work for you. It's adjusting the timing on the electrical distribution, the firing of the spark plugs to match a start sequence. And then as the engine's running, that timing will change again you know, for a, a running sequence. Um, and it's adjusting the mixture for you. But when we look at airplane engines, they're fairly traditional. The, the reason that is, is because an airplane engine really does not need much electricity to operate. All it needs are the magnetos to generate spark. And magnetos are essentially fail safe. I mean, they're basically a magnet wrapped, uh, or surrounded by some coiled wire. And so it's very difficult for a magneto to fail. So when you look at an airplane engine, especially a piston airplane engine, uh, especially an avgas piston airplane engine, you typically don't see anything like uh, fully automated digital engine controls or FADEC. Uh, you have very, very simple systems. A mixture control which you're running, you have fixed timing. The timing never really changes, okay? So essentially the problem that we run into as pilots is they become much harder to start. Just like an old car from the 50s would be more difficult to start. And if you ever started an old car, uh, if you had like a 70s, you know, like a Buick or something, you may find that occasionally you would pump that accelerator a couple times. That essentially primed the engine. I don't know if you've ever heard of people pumping the throttle on an engine to prime it. Inside the carburetor on a car, there's a little accelerator pump or on, a, on any carburetor. Um, and as you move the throttle in quickly, that accelerator pump adds a little splash of fuel. And that's essentially to make up for the fact that it takes time for that fuel air mixture to adjust as you open the throttle rapidly. So if you open the throttle too rapidly, you'll actually starve the engine of fuel. You have too much air and not enough fuel. So they put a little pump in there called an accelerator pump. So if you jam that throttle forward, it helps shoot some extra fuel up the carburetor so that the engine doesn't quit out. Well, old cars, people would use at the prime. You'd sit there and you'd stamp the accelerator pedal a few times and then you'd hit the ignition. So when we go back to airplanes, we ask the question, why do we need to prime them? The reality is they're not nearly as technologically advanced as our modern car engines. Now you're starting to see that change. If you look at diesel engines, uh, diesel aircraft engines, they are much easier to start and they use FADEC to control them. But typically you do not see that on Avgas engines, not at least right now. Um, and something to think about when we look at aviation engines, things change very, very slowly. There's not a lot of them out there in the field. And so because of that, it takes a long time to figure out how reliable the design is and what kind of maintenance issues you're gonna have. So oftentimes, and one of the things that we say is, you know, when new technology comes out, we oftentimes adopt a bit of a wait and see attitude uh, because you can find out that it ends up failing earlier, requiring maintenance earlier. You really wanna let it kind of adapt in the field. And that takes a long time. So that's kind of the long explanation of why we prime in an aircraft engine. But again, it's because everything is essentially constant. Um, okay, so let's take a look. Um, when we look at the iPad, what you can see here is what happens when we prime too much. Again, as I said, priming is essentially a mist. And as that fuel gets sucked into this intake manifold, you'll see that it can start to pool on that cylinder head. And if the primer line is earlier in the intake manifold, now the fuel can start to pool in the manifold itself. The other problem that you can run into is that as this cylinder moves up, there's always the chance that it can splash some fuel. So you may have additional fuel that starts to pool maybe in the exhaust manifold, or it could also pool in the intake manifold. So essentially when we talk about a flooded engine, this is what we're looking at right here. We're looking at um, pooled fuel, either in the intake manifold or in the cylinder. And the problem that you run into there, when we talk about po pooled fuel is that, you know, too much fuel actually makes the engine harder to start than not enough fuel. And that's because you need the right amount of fuel and air, uh, that right fuel and air mixture to combust. If you have too much fuel, the air is too saturated, it doesn't end up burning. Essentially, it just sits there. So when the cylinder has puddled fuel in it, essentially, when you have your throttle cracked open, there's not enough air coming into the cylinder 
to get that cylinder to fire. And so anytime you flooded it, anytime you've got liquid fuel, you can tell because you'll be cranking it and it might cough a little bit, but it's just kind of sitting there. That essentially means that that fuel air mixture is way too wet. There's way too much fuel. So if we take a look back at the iPad, there are a couple solutions. We're gonna jump in and number one of those is to open that throttle. So what you could see here, if you look down at this throttle valve, we've got this sitting full open. If you realize that you've flooded the engine, essentially you wanna give up trying to start it and you wanna take a break. And you wanna allow that fuel to start to evaporate out. And so the easiest way to do that is to shut down the airplane, turn off the electrical system, turn off all the pumps, and then leave the mixture, you can leave it at idle cutoff and move the throttle to full open. And what that's gonna do is that opens the butterfly valve and just allows the outside air to enter your intake manifold. And that will start to dry out that pooled fuel in the intake manifold. And now you'll go back from a, a flooded start to a normal start. If you realize the engine's flooded, and the easiest way to know this is you've primed two or three times and it's definitely not starting. Um, if you realize that engine is flooded, the best thing to do is to open up the throttle, give it five minutes, 10 minutes, let it start to evaporate out. Okay, looks like we've got a question. Okay, Peter's got a question. Uh, and the reason I brought this one up is that with the slide that you're on, it's perfect timing. Peter says, can you explain what the manifold does? Uh, and in here, I think he's referring to the intake manifold. Sure, so um, I'm actually gonna jump to a different slide so you can see this. This gives you a better idea of the intake and the exhaust manifolds. So if you look at the top, this large tool right here, this large tube, that is your intake manifold. And then the red one is your exhaust, ma exhaust manifold. Essentially what your intake manifold does is it allows air to pass through the air filter, through your fuel, uh, and then from there into the cylinder. So it takes clean air, through the air filter, and then into the cylinders. In this case, we have a turbocharger on this engine, and so the only difference is the air is pressurized before it moves through the manifold and into the cylinders. If you're normally aspirated, which means you don't have a turbocharger or a supercharger on the airplane, the air just basically goes directly through the filter, through your throttle valve, and then down into the cylinders. And the throttle valve is there basically to control how much air can move. So the more open the throttle valve is, the more air can move through, through that air filter and then down into the cylinders. And then if you're carbureted in that throttle valve, it will automatically mix with fuel based on where you have your mixture control set. If you're fuel injected, fuel injectors right in front of the intake valve will continuously spray fuel. They don't spray every time the cylinder opens, they just keep spraying fuel. And then that fuel mixes right in front of the cylinder and then it goes into the, into the cylinder chamber. Um, the reason we have an intake manifold is just to guide that cool, uh, fresh outside air through an air filter, possibly through a turbocharger, and then from there, mix it with fuel and take it into the cylinder. The exhaust manifold essentially is the same thing. It's a big metal tube, but now it's taking the hot combusted air out and it's trying to route it safely out of the cowl. And actually, if you took your exhaust manifold off, you temporarily have better engine power because exhaust manifolds create a little bit of what we like to call back pressure. Because the air can't just go anywhere at once when it exits the cylinder, it has to go through the tubes, it takes a little bit of force to do that. It's kind of like blowing through the straw, it takes a little bit of force to push the air through the tube. You can call that exhaust back pressure. And so exhaust systems are designed to minimize that back pressure because as the cylinder is coming up in that last stroke, pushing out all the burned air, it's also pushing against any back pressure that you would have in the exhaust stack. And so if you look at this exhaust system here, you can see that that hot air exits the cylinders, it moves back, and then in this case, it's gonna either go through a turbine which is going to power our turbocharger, and then it exits the airplane. Some of it will go through what we call a wastegate. And essentially in a turbocharged airplane, a wastegate simply exists to allow some air to bypass the turbocharger so that you don't overpressurize the engine. So as the engine's getting to its rated intake pressure, 
as it reaches it, the wastegate starts to open and it allows extra exhaust pack, uh, gases to pass. So the turbocharger just maintains the airplane's rated top pressure. So in the Cirrus round, you know, maybe 36 and a half to maybe 37 inches in that turbocharged airplane. If the airplane's turbo normalized, which just basically means it brings it up to sea level pressure, it's usually adjusted somewhere around 30 inches, maybe 29.9 to 30, maybe 30 and a half inches. So essentially, that's what those two uh, manifolds do. And if you look at an airplane, you can easily see the exhaust manifold. It looks like it's been burned. I mean, it's, it's got that kind of brown, not rusty, but just heat treated kind of look to it. Whereas your intake manifold generally is going to be, it's very cool. It never heats up because it doesn't have hot exhaust passing through it. And so typically that's going to look brand new in silver. And exhaust manifolds, as we'll take a look in a little bit, um, they tend to crack especially on turbocharged aircraft. They typically need to be replaced at some point in time, um, and those cracks can allow hot gases to escape. Okay, so we've talked about overpriming, and we've talked about the fact that you end up with pooled fuel sitting inside that cylinder or inside the intake or exhaust manifolds. And if we go back, you could take a look at the exhaust manifold. Actually, we'll, we'll stay on this diagram for a second. If you take a look at the exhaust manifold, there really isn't anything combustible once we go out, okay? Uh, the turbine is all metal and it's meant to handle very high temperatures, maybe 1,750 degrees. So that's extremely hot exhaust gases. And then the wastegate, same thing. It's meant to handle very high temperatures and then it exits out the exhaust pipe. So pooled fuel in the exhaust usually is moving away from other combustible sources. But if you have pool fuel in the intake manifold, now we start to run into some problems. And the problem is, if we follow that in intake manifold back, eventually we're gonna get to maybe the throttle body. And so if we are carbureted, once you look at the throttle, let me pull that out, you'll notice you have both the throttle. This is an updraft style carburetor that you would typically find in, on an airplane. It's located on the bottom of the engine oftentimes. Um, the air comes up through it like this, but right here we have a float chamber full of fuel. So that the problem that you run into is as that fuel is puddled here and starting to possibly drip down the intake manifold, it arrives at that carburetor where all of the fuel is. If you're fuel injected, you're still gonna have a fuel distribution unit. And so that fuel moves close to that. And then here's another thing. If we take a look at um, this airplane here, it's a Cessna 172. And as I zoom in, you can see this area right here. That is your air filter. And so everybody's seeing these kind of on the front of Cessnas, uh, very common, it's an air filter. And so essentially that's at the very beginning of the intake system. If you were to overprime enough, eventually the fuel could go all the way through that intake manifold and down to the air filter. And in a Cessna and many of these air filters, they're coated with kind of an oil, uh, and the oil essentially helps clean the air before it gets into the engine. It makes sure that that air is free of dust and dirt and stuff like that. But the problem is, if you mix that oil with gas, you essentially end up with something that is really flammable. And so you do not want any fire to get down there. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening during an engine fire and start. The airplane is flooded. We have fuel in the cylinder. We have fuel in the intake manifold, possibly some fuel in the exhaust. Essentially, we have two, ex uh, two ignition points, one of which is in the exhaust manifold. This fuel right here starts draining down. All of a sudden, the fuel-air mixture gets right. You ended up with just enough heat entering this area, um, and boom, your exhaust manifold ignites. If this happens, you'll know it. Typically, you hear it as a backfire. That's all those gases suddenly escaping the uh, exhaust manifold. And if you hear a backfire, essentially what that's telling you is you've probably overprimed the engine, or you turned it off and on in the wrong, you know, left it off too long and it started back up kind of out of, essentially out of cycle and it backfires. Either case, you wanna run it for a few seconds. We'll talk about that. And then if it backfired bad enough, shut it down. On the intake manifold, if this area was to burn first, now you have a real problem. And that problem is that this fire can start to move back through the intake manifold 
all the way down to either the carburetor or the fuel distribution unit is where you have a large fuel source or into the air filter where you also have a very large fuel source. So let's take a look at the essential, uh, the 172's engine fire during start. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in on this. So, first of all, during start on the ground, magnetic switch to start, continue to crank to start the engine. This is one of the things that I think people uh, struggle with simply because it feels so unnatural. But if you expect, if you feel like there's maybe a loud backfire or someone's waving at you, uh, you could see flames, possibly smoke, you feel the heat, you want to continue to crank the engine. So why are we doing that? Well, if you think about what's happening, We've got an engine that's generating suction in the intake manifold, and then it's pushing air out of the exhaust manifold. And as you're cranking it, it's doing that. If you've got fuel pooled in the intake manifold and you have a fire there, by continuing to crank the engine, you're sucking the air through the intake manifold back into the cylinder and then out the exhaust, where there really isn't very much flammable. So the advantage when you're cranking the engine is that you're sucking the fire back into the engine and you're preventing it from getting down to the carburetor or down to the air filter on the front of the airplane. That's why we wanna continue cranking during an engine fire during start. You don't want the fire to move down the intake. You wanna keep air moving through the intake and into the engine. And the idea is we wanna to try to pull that fire back into the engine, which you know inside the cylinder, it's meant to burn. And again, if you stopped cranking, the fire probably wouldn't go out. The fuel, air, the fuel and ambient air mixture is probably enough at that point in time to continue burning. So we want to get the airflow uh, back towards the engine and suck the fire into the engine. Okay, so then you can see here it says, if engine starts, power 1800 RPM for a few minutes. Then engine shut down and inspect for damage. So we want to run it for a few minutes, which also seems kind of counterintuitive, but essentially it could take a minute or two to burn off all of that pooled fuel in the intake manifold. So number one, as the engine starts, chances are the fire in the intake manifold will go out. You have too much air moving over the fuel in the intake air manifold, and now the fuel air mixture is too lean. So the fire in the intake manifold will go out but you still have possibly pooled fuel in there. And by running the engine for a few minutes, you're running dry air over that fuel, which is going to evaporate it out. So A, you're making sure the fire in the intake manifold is out, and then B, by running it for a few minutes, you're making sure that you've given the engine time to suck enough clean air through the intake manifold that any fuel that was stuck there has now evaporated off and that intake manifold is dry. Okay, so if the engine fails to start, what are we gonna do? Throttle control, full, push full in. So essentially we're opening the throttle as much as possible. Why are we doing that? Again, we wanna try to get as much airflow through the intake manifold as possible. And so by opening that throttle valve fully, you're getting as much fresh air in there as possible. Number one, you've got a lot of pooled fuel, so it's gonna increase the chance of the engine starting. Okay, and if there is a fire in the intake manifold, opening that throttle might lower that fuel air mixture enough where that, that fire goes out in the intake manifold and then it just essentially sucks the fuel in and burns it in the cylinders. But we're gonna go as well, mixture control, idle cutoff. So essentially, if the engine's not starting, but you feel like there's a fire up there, we're gonna continue cranking to suck air through, but we're gonna cut the mixture so that we're not adding more fuel into the fire. Magneto switch, continue cranking. Okay, again, to try to pull the fire into the engine. Fuel shutoff valve off. So again, we're getting rid of the source of fuel. Fuel pump switch off. And then after that shut down, magneto switch off, standby battery switch off, master switch and alternator, uh, alternator and battery off, secure the engine, and then release the parking brake. They're doing that in case you need to pull or tow the airplane somewhere, and then grab the fire extinguisher and get out of the airplane. So essentially, the order that we're trying to go here is we're trying to get the engine to start. 
And if the engine doesn't start, we're going to continue to pull air through the intake manifold, as much air as we can get, and into the engine by continuing to crank and leaving the throttle full open, but then we're going to completely shut off the fuel supply by cutting the mixture, turning the fuel selectors off, turning our fuel pumps off, and then we're going to secure the aircraft, get it into a position where if it is on fire, it can still be moved, releasing that parking brake, and then evacuating the aircraft. Okay, we've got a question. Okay, so Andrew wants to know that since you just went through this procedure, is this procedure true in both carbureted and fuel injected engines? Great question. So let's take a look um, at the, I believe this version of the Cessna is fuel injected. Um, if you take a look at the Cirrus, uh, which is another fuel injected turbocharged engine, um, first of all, the short answer is yes. It's true essentially in every airplane. In fact, an engine fire during start is almost like spin recovery. Um, in general, we follow one general procedure and in any airplane engine, it's unless they have a very, I've never seen an engine that wouldn't follow this. So I can't imagine a case that wouldn't. In every engine carbureted to fuel injected, it's essentially continue cranking. If the engine's not starting, getting that throttle to full open, then cut off the fuel supply and exit the airplane. So if you look at a Cirrus, um, you can see here, whoop, there we go. I'm gonna go back one and forward one. It doesn't seem to wanna draw right. Yeah, it's not highlighting. So we'll just describe it. Mixture to cut off, fuel pump to off, fuel selector to off, power lever advance, and starter continue cranking. So you can see here in the Cirrus SR22, we're doing essentially the same thing. Um, we're doing it in a slightly different order. We're turning off the fuel flow first, and then we're bringing the power lever up, and we're continuing to crank the starter. Um, and then it says, if flames persist, perform the emergency engine shutdown on ground and emergency ground egress checklist. Um, so again, the exact same thing. And that's something to keep in mind with. An engine fire during start, essentially, no matter what kind of airplane you fly, you're essentially doing the same thing, sucking the air in by cranking, throttle, and then if the engine isn't starting, shutting it down. One thing I would say is this. Um, this is something that few people practice frequently in the airplane, just moving the controls. But the problem is, with an engine fire during start, once you recognize it, the fire may have been burning for a little while and could be quickly starting to spread towards your carburetor, your air filter, down the intake manifold. So it's a good idea to get yourself very comfortable with the memory items on this engine, uh, on this engine fire during start checklist so that it feels very natural if you need to do that. Now, typically in the air, we have a little bit of time to react. Um, engine fire and flight, you have a little bit of time to react. But on the ground, there's very little airflow uh, and things can get bad very, very quickly. Okay, we've got another question. Okay, so Chris wants to know, how quickly does it become obvious that your engine is on fire? So, it can actually be a little difficult and sometimes uh, the best way to recognize that the engine is on fire uh, could be someone else pointing at it. Um, I know the one time that it happened at a flight school that I worked at, the crew didn't even recognize it. It was another flight student and instructor uh, that could see the flames coming out of the cowl. They're the ones that indicated it. You may possibly feel heat. You can smell possibly burning avgas, or you can start to smell a lot of avgas. And in, in that case, uh, you might see a little bit of smoke. Um, you might see kind of that wavy air that, you know, when you've got a lot of heat coming up from the cowl, all of a sudden things start to, you know, the, the kind of that mirage look as you look out there where the air starts to look a little bit wavy. Those are gonna be your, your best indications. Um, you're typically, by the time you see flames coming out of the top of the cowl, you have a serious fire. And so, uh, you know, by that time, it's probably beyond what you can put out with the throttle and the starter. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that you wanna keep in mind is you're really not looking for flames. You're looking for signs of heat, the smell of fuel, someone on the ramp pointing, um, um, any heat that you feel, uh, or again, you know, possibly backfiring uh, in the exhaust. Something also to keep in mind, 
Um, occasionally, I've walked by aircraft on the ramp where you could tell that they had been overprimed just simply by the amount of avgas that you could smell walking by the airplane. Um, and when you get in the cockpit, you can smell the same thing. So if you can smell a lot of avgas in the cockpit after you've primed the engine or after several start attempts, you've flooded the engine. Um, that's a key. You can smell that. And in that case, leave the throttle open and give it time to air out. Okay, we've got another question. Okay, this one comes from Fly for Fun. And they say, I read that when it's very cold, I should wait about 30 seconds after priming to hit the starter to allow the gas to atomize. It seems to help, but does it really? That's a great question. Uh, and it depends on the aircraft design. Uh, the concept is sound though. Uh, initially, when you spray some fuel out of the primer line or out of a fuel injector, it's going to be liquid. Um, and so, and that cold air, think about this, cold air doesn't need much gas. Uh, essentially it doesn't, I guess, I don't know, it, it, it's more dense. So I guess it would mean it would need more gas. So by, by um, letting it sit there, you might give it a chance to suck up more of that fuel for that fuel to vaporize. Again, it's not liquid gas that burns, it's the fuel vapors that burn. So I could see that. I could see that being true in, in cold air. You know, it, since the air is so dense, dense it, it essentially gives it time to, to um, absorb all the fuel. In a turbocharged airplane, what we have typically found um, is that cold starts are very, or not turbocharged, a fuel injected engine, cold starts are typically very, very easy. Um, in a carbureted engine, they are much tougher. And again, part of that is just simply the fact that you don't get quite as much fuel right into the cylinder and you have a lot of dense air. Okay, we've got another question. Okay, so Merle wants to know, does a backfire warrant a shutdown and inspection? I would call this an it depends. Um, I have occasionally backfired an engine a handful of times uh, during the mag check. Okay, so in that case, essentially the combustion cycle differs from where everything comes back on. And usually it's pretty mild, just a little pop. Um, and I have occasionally, probably two or three times, um, had a little pop during start. Um, not very loud, just a little, you know, and in that case, I would say, no, you're fine. Uh, however, if you're cranking, 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 and you get a loud backfire, absolutely, I would run the engine for a few minutes, and I would shut down and inspect it. And again, that's where it really comes down to an it depends. Um, if there's a little bit of fuel in there or is a timing issue, um, really not an issue. But if it's a significant backfire, man, you can hear it. Nothing bad. Uh, inspecting the engine, opening it up, making sure the exhaust manifold is still on there firmly, that there's no damage or signs of fire inside the cowling. That's what I'd be looking for. Okay, we've got another question. Okay, next up, this comes from Lewis, and he wants to know, is it true that we prime an engine because of the fuel vapor in the fuel lines in a fuel-injected engine? That's a great hot start procedure. And um, there's quite a few hot start procedures out there. Um, but one of the problems that you run into in fuel lines and fuel-injected airplanes is they're typically located on top of the engine, and heat starts to rise. And most fuel-injected engines also have fairly tight cowls. Most modern aircraft have very tight cowls. So there's nowhere for the heat to go. So as the airplane sits on the ramp, maybe longer than 15, and our airplane about 20 minutes, um, that heat starts to soak up, and those the entire time the temperature in those fuel lines starts to increase because okay, it's absorbing the heat from the engine that's moving up. After maybe 15 or 20 minutes, that fuel will vaporize in those lines. And it really depends on the design of engine. In some engines, if the mixture is at idle cutoff, the distributor lines will remain liquid because they're essentially sealed and it doesn't have anywhere to expand. But then the fuel behind the distributor lines, it will start to vaporize. In some airplanes, the entire fuel system will start to vaporize. And if you're at high density altitude, um, we've had this problem uh, both in Telluride and Hayden on DAs where the, the or days where the density altitude was about 14, 15,000 feet and it's about 80 degrees up there, really, really hot. Um, in that case, we've had cases where the fuel vaporizes essentially all the way back to the firewall. So the concept is if you bring the engine or if you bring the fuel pump on to high boost or prime, what you're going to do is pump the vapor out until you get liquid back into those fuel lines. That's what you're trying to do. 
because the engine won't run when it's vapor locked, when there's vapor inside the lines. Now, how that's accomplished depends on the different types of engines. So in our engine, it's, um, uh, it's a Continental TSIO 550 uh, or a K. You're right. Yeah, or a K. There you go, TSO 550K. Um, in our aircraft, essentially what you can do is you can move the mixture control all the way to idle cutoff, and you open the throttle, and then you'll run high prime, um, or high boost and prime, for about 20 seconds. Every one of those fuel control units has a return line, okay? And that return line, because they can supply much more fuel than the engine needs. And so that return line essentially takes the fuel the engine doesn't need, and it sends it back to the fuel system. And so by having the mixture at idle cutoff, essentially none of the fuel is able to make it past the, the fuel metering unit. And so it just kind of circulates in there. And by running it for about 20 seconds, it's going to pump cool fuel up into the system. If you just do it for two or three seconds, you're still gonna have warm fuel in the system. It might liquefy, but then in maybe another 10 to 15 seconds, it's gonna vaporize. So typically what'll happen is you'll see you go to try to start it, it starts to start, and then it dies out again. You can call that a false start. By, by getting that cool liquid fuel in there, it would take quite a while for the fuel to vaporize. And by that time, the engine will be running and the fuel pumps can supply enough pressure to keep the fuel liquid. Uh, essentially, when you have the engine-driven pump and the electric pump, pump running, the engine is able to supply enough pressure in the fuel lines that even though the fuel can start to get hot, A, it's moving through quickly, so it doesn't get a chance to absorb as much heat, and then B, it's under pressure, so it remains liquefied even at higher temperatures. Okay, so that procedure that I talked about right there is out of the um, Teledyne Continental Tips for Engine Care Manual, um, and that applies to Continental engines. Uh, there are some exceptions depending on your engine model. So if you're flying a Continental turbocharged or fuel-injected engine, uh, you can search online for the TCM Tips for Engine Care Manual, and it's about an 80-page manual, and it goes through hot starts, and it talks about different engine types. Uh, light Cummings can be a little bit different. And so if your POH doesn't have any guidance, Look to your engine manufacturer. They may publish a tips document that's separate than your POH that can help you. But again, that concept of running the fuel pump to get uh, liquid fuel in the lines, that's essentially what you're trying to do there is, is to remove that vapor lock. The problem is if you were to do that with the mixture control full open for 20 seconds, you're just gonna pour fuel into the intake manifold of the engine. You're gonna flood it out again. And again, now you have the chance for an engine fire. So, okay, um, if there are any more questions on priming or kind of the differences between hot starts and normal starts and engine fires, throw them on out there. But otherwise, I'm gonna start into engine fires during flight. These are significantly more rare. Um, they are rarely caused by the pilot. While engine fires during start are generally caused by the pilot, engine fires during flight uh, are generally a mechanical issue. And that's why they're so rare. At the end of the day, they just don't happen a lot. And essentially, if you think about it, there's two combustible sources that are running through your engine. Fuel is the obvious one, and then oil is the other. And so when we look at an engine fire during flight, typically what's happened is a fuel line is separated or is leaking, or an oil line is separated or is leaking, and now that fuel or oil is spraying onto the hot engine, and eventually it can start to combust. Now there's some advantages. At high speeds with lots of airflow, it actually can sometimes be difficult for that fuel or oil to combust just simply because there is enough air moving over the engine. So if you're operating at really high speeds, uh, you, may, you may be able to blow it out. And you'll notice that in an engine fire during flight checklist, typically we're trying to increase the airspeed to blow it out. The problem is if you left the engine running, as you slow down to enter the pattern, you still have that leak. You still have that source of, of combustible fuel hitting the engine and the engine fire will light back up. So typically, even if you're able to blow it out with airspeed, uh, you need that engine shut down because as you start to slow down, the fuel will start burning again. Okay, so let's take a look at a typical, oh, let's see, not that one. Engine fire during flight checklist. Okay, so this is a Cessna 172 engine fire during flight checklist. And if we take a look at it, um, mixture control, idle cutoff, pull it all the way out. 
Um, so what we're trying to do here is immediately reduce the fuel, the supply of, of gas. If the fire is started by um, fuel lines that are broke or something like that, that will stop it, or at least stop the flow of fuel. Fuel shutoff valve, off. So again, we're getting rid of the supply of fuel. The other thing when we turn the fuel shutoff valve off is we're essentially creating a fire barrier between the engine and the rest of the fuel systems in the wings. So it kind of prevents fire from moving back. And then fuel pump switch off, again, trying to stop the flow of combustible fuel to the engine. And then master switch, alternate, alternator and battery off. Again, if the fire was caused um, by an electrical short um, that, that maybe ignited some insulation or something like that, we're gonna get rid of that as well. So essentially what we've done now through this is we've removed <clears throat> the combustible sources that we can control. We stop fuel if that's the cause of the problem. Okay, and we've turned off the electrical system, um, the alternators and batteries. Now, while those don't affect the fuel or the engine's operation itself, if there's some sort of an uh, electrical fire up there that's ignited insulation, maybe around a fuel line or uh, a fuel or oil line or something like that, or just insulation in the cowl, that will stop that part of the fire. Okay, in the Cessna, you'll notice step number five, cabin vents open as needed. So the concept here is if you've got fire fumes moving into the cabin. They could, uh, you, could, you could pass out to them. You may not be able to see the engine gauges. And so in a Cessna, when you look at those um, air vents, they're out on the wing and the fresh air inlets never go through the front of the engine. They go from the wings and then from there into the cabin. So by opening up the cabin vents, you're getting airflow that's far away from the engine into the airplane to start to vent the airplane out, okay? Cabin heat and cabin air controls push full in uh, to avoid drafts. Essentially now, the cabin heat, that's coming off the engine. So we don't want any of that air coming into the airplane because that's contaminated air. <clears throat> Airspeed, 100 knots. If fire is not extinguished, increase glide speed to find an airspeed within limitations that will provide an incombustible mixture. So again, remember we talked about this. The more air we supply, eventually you've got kind of a finite supply of fuel going on there, okay? Maybe it's spraying oil or it's spraying avgas onto the engine at a given rate. And by increasing our indicated airspeed, we're gonna add a whole bunch of air to it, which essentially will blow it out. The fuel air mixture gets way too lean and the, the fire on top of the engine was to go out. And again, if someone says, well, then wouldn't you start the engine back up? Well, let's say the engine itself isn't damaged. Let's say that, you know, there's a fuel line that's broken, but other than that, that's the only damage that's been done by the time you blow it out. If you were to turn the engine back on, you're reintroducing that fuel source. And when you reintroduce the fuel source, essentially you're going to restart the fire as you slow down. So when you look at that, you know, just because you've gotten the fire out, you know, People might say, well, I don't want to do a forced landing. You notice that's the last step here is a forced landing. And if you can't fly to an airport, if you've got to make it on a field or a road, you may say, well, I don't want to do that. Can't I just restart the engine? Keep in mind, as you get rid of the airspeed, if you reintroduce the fuel with a running engine, that, that fire will start back up. Okay, we'll quickly compare that to a Cirrus SR22, slightly different airplane with a slightly different design. Uh, you'll notice most of the steps are the same, mixtures to cut off, fuel pumps off, fuel selectors off, but in this one you'll notice our airflow, airflow selector goes to off. So in this airplane, an SR22 Turbo uh, G6, this is true for most of the Cirrus aircraft, um, the air routes through the, uh, through the engine compartment and from there into the cabin. So we want that airflow selector off so we don't bring in any contaminated um, airflow. As we continue going down, power lever to idle, ignition switch to off. So again, we're shutting down the engine and then cabin doors partially open. So if you pop them, you won't be able to get them very open, but if you pop the doors and push them out, they'll vent out just a little bit. And the concept here is if you have some smoke or fumes into the cockpit or in the cockpit, you'll generate some suction and it'll pull that smoke and fumes out of the cockpit. Okay, so that's why when we look at an engine fire during flight, uh, some people notice, well, my airplane says open the vents, my airplane says close the vents. It all depends on the design of the, air, the environmental air system. If the environmental air system is going through 
the engine or in a place where engine fumes could contaminate it, you're going to shut it down. On the other hand, if you've got the ability to pull in fresh vented air that would not be close to the fire, you'll oftentimes turn those on to try to vent out the cabin. Okay, um, if you take a look, that's all the time we've got for tonight. Uh, we've got IFR coming up next in about 10 minutes. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this video, we've got three links. Uh, one of them is to our Mastering Takeoffs and Landings course. Uh, if you haven't tried it, uh, summer is the best time to practice takeoffs and landings. And as we get into fall, uh, we're starting to get back into crosswind season. Uh, it's a fantastic course. Uh, three hours of footage filmed in Steamboat, Colorado, and then airports around the West. Um, and it applies whether you're flying a 172, uh, 182, SR-22. It's filmed in our airplane, but the principles apply to anybody. And it always comes with a 30-day back money uh, or 30 day money back guarantee. Uh, item number two is a link to the IFR presentation that starts in 10 minutes. We're going over lost com, com procedures. So even if you're not an instrument rated pilot, I haven't studied that yet, um, we'll basically start at the basics with an example flight from Rocky Mountain Metro to Santa Fe, and then we'll take a look at some uh, transport category operations as well. And then finally, uh, we've got a link to send us some feedback. Uh, as we get back into the fall season here, we'd like to have your ideas uh, for topics. Engine fires and flight came straight out of that uh, feedback. So please shoot us an email uh, and we'll add those topics to the list. Thanks for joining us tonight. And I hope to see you for IFR in about 10 minutes. Good night.